White hot sparks fly as a hammer makes contact with a fiery red piece of metal. The sound of the hammer strikes ring through the sooty old forge like a high-pitched metronome. The pair of sturdy iron tongs, the glowing piece of metal is picked up and placed into a bucket of liquid. A huge cloud of steam rises and fills the room. As the steam dissipates, we see the molten gold-colored eyes of Julia Jules Davala. She moves further into the room and places the now cooling piece of metal on a workbench filled with other small pieces and parts. Just a few more sections, then I can put you together, baby girl. And you're gonna be beautiful, aren't you? She gently touches the cylindrical form of a disassembled gun barrel, the soft red shade of her skin reflecting in the high shine of the metal. Talking to your work again, Jules. I'm telling you, people are gonna think your gear's done slip cog if you do that out in public. The good-natured jab is from a coal-dust-coated dwarf sitting on a stool in the corner smoking on an ornately crafted metal pipe. Durgan, a master metallurgist and owner of this forge, has been her friend and mentor for the last 12 years. She wipes her dirty hands on a similarly stained rag and chuckles. <laughs> yeah, well, if talking to my masterpiece makes me crazy, then I'm in good company, right, old man? She tosses the rag at him with a wink and covers the work table with a relatively clean sheet. She takes off her thick leather apron and puts on a well-worn hat, the brim formed into a smooth upward curve on the sides to show off pointed ears and long red and yellow hair that glows like lava in the shadowed room. As she leaves the forge, she pulls out what looks to be a piecemeal pocket watch. All right, Duggan, I'll see you later. It's time to do a little business. His bushy eyebrows draw together as he scowls over his pipe. Not getting into any trouble, are you, lass? If you're looking for work, I told you I could probably get you on the Hydra Forge. Still got a bit of pull over there. No need for you to be involved with that unsavory lot that you hang about. Standing in the dimly lit doorway, the evening light outside creates a silhouette of her body. She turns her head just enough to see Durgan and sends him a warm smile. Don't you worry yourself, old man. I got everything under control. She tips her hat and walks out into the setting sun. She makes her way across the residential neighborhood of Steamhaven, into the raucous area known as the Ferris Quarter. All around the industrial district of Smokeside, Tall smokestacks constantly billow out huge plumes of steam, while gears and cogs turn in both the mechanisms of the city as well as its people's minds, creating the perpetual thrum of activity and creativity. This is Alkenstar, the city of smog, and it is quite aptly named. She pauses across the street from the lively saloon called the Barrel and Bullet, a favored watering hole of many smokeside residents. Certainly isn't the stomping ground of high society, but neither is it a true dive. The patrons are your typical working folks and they served a decent enough mug of ale, but more importantly, the place was widely known as a sort of neutral ground, which allied perfectly with Jules' needs tonight. Checking her pocket watch once more, she nods and heads into the saloon. As always, the bar is nearly full, Jaunty piano music can sporadically be heard between the bouts of loud laughter and boisterous voices. A quick smile and a nod of the head from the ever-present owner, Phoebe Dunsmith, is the only greeting she receives as she makes her way to an unoccupied table in the back corner of the room. A server approaches and takes her order for two pints of ale. Not long after the ales are dropped off, she is joined by a half-elf male. Dark brown hair lays in oily strands that nearly reach his shoulders. As he slides into his seat, his equally dark eyes dart around the room nervously. Bryce Bolts, calm down, Jax. You look like you're smuggling sky-side jewels in your ass. The half-elf cuts her an unamused glare, but does noticeably relax. Leaning in closer, Jules takes a sip of her drink. Watery, but still refreshing after a hard day in the forge. So, what do we got, and when do we move? Jax leans in as well, and in a much quieter voice than Jules whispers, Five crates of guns, and three crates of ammo. 
a general assortment of artillery, nothing too fancy, but solid pieces, straight from the gunworks. We are supposed to meet the barge captain under the bridges tomorrow night. He said he won't be able to stop long, and if we can't meet him before he makes it to the docks, the deal is off. Jules nods. The timing and execution of the trades were always tricky, but she still much preferred working with the barge captains and cutting them in on the deal to the other methods she had seen used in the past. There was a reason she didn't do runs with the Wasteland Marauders anymore. She had no qualms with taking from those who could afford to lose some coin, and yeah, she might steal and deal in weapons that can take a life, but killing wasn't how she and her crew operated. Murder was just bad for business. All right. Make sure the crew is ready and in place by 9 p.m. The barges typically don't come in till 11 at the earliest, so we should be good. I've already got a couple of buyers lined up, so we should have all the goods sold within the next three days. If this run goes off without a hitch, we'll all be sitting pretty for at least the next few months. Jax drains his ale, nods, and leaves the table. After a few minutes, Jules follows suit. A small, determined smile on her face, she exits the saloon and begins her trek back towards Steamhaven. But after only a couple of streets, she starts to feel the weight of someone's gaze on her back. She turns off the main street onto an alley with boxes stacked high on its side, easy to hide behind or climb up and escape if need be. After a moment, a shadow falls into the mouth of the alley. Be at ease, Miss Davalo. I've come to make a deal. I'd love to speak face to face, but only if you'll assure me that you won't gun me down as I turn this corner. The voice was cocky and smooth, and she knew immediately the snake that it belonged to. Ambrose Muglin. The infamous financier and power broker was well known throughout all of Alkenstar. While he may be considered a member of the city's aristocracy, most everyone knows that that sleazy son of a bitch is as rotten as they come. Peeking out from behind a large crate, Jules keeps her cover, but calls out to the alley opening. Sure thing, Muglin. We can be civil-like. Let's have a chat. Besides, I know your boys can't be too far away. And at that, the sound of shuffling feet comes from the other end of the alley, where two half-orc lackeys settle against the walls, their hands resting on their gun belts. Ah, oh, yes, you know Smokeside can be so dangerous at times. It's important to have people you can depend on at your back. Now, Miss Davala, to the business at hand. And out steps the diminutive form of Ambrose Mugland. The halfling has a neatly styled head of blonde hair that shines in the evening lamplight and a black mustache that tilts upwards in a slight but somehow sinister swirl. He wears a well-tailored suit and at his waist is a beautifully wrought gun that begrudgingly makes Jules' mouth water. I'll cut to the chase, Miss Davalo. I've had my eyes on your little gun trade business venture and I want in. You and your crew seem to have a knack for gun running, but you think too small. With my guidance and insider information, you can make much bigger hauls and in turn make much more money for both of us. He takes a cigar from his breast pocket, lighting it with an ornate gold lighter. The cherry glows bright on his inhale and casts an eerie red glow onto his face. So what do you say? Deal? Jules can't help herself. She laughs. <laughs> Sorry, Muglin. Not to be rude, but you quite literally could not pay me to get in bed with you. I've heard all about your particular brand of guidance, and it doesn't exactly align with how me and my crew run. A stream of smoke pours from his mouth, obscuring his face for a moment. Hmm. I see. Well... If you're not smart enough to take a golden opportunity when it's handed to you, you are certainly not someone that I want to work with. 
and with that he turns to leave, but as he exits the alley, he calls over his shoulder. Best of luck to you, but remember, even if you play small, you can still lose big. And with that, he and his cronies are gone. With a sigh of relief and more than a few nervous glances over her shoulder, Jules makes her way back home. After a long night of fairly restless sleep and a day filled with uninspired and distracted work in the forge, it was finally time to head to the bridges and meet up with the rest of the crew. Just like they'd done it a few times before, they would position themselves on a small boat tucked into the shadows under the bridges that spanned the Ustradi River, connecting Smokeside to the southern section of Skyside. The whole process had to move very quickly. They had, from the first bridge to the second one, about 200 feet up river to slip in alongside the barge and quickly moor the smaller craft to the larger. Then, hop on board and grab the agreed-upon crates, transfer them to their boat, and move away from the larger ship, all before passing under the second bridge. Without the cover of shadows under the bridges, someone from the docks would be able to see the theft, and the gig would be up. Near midnight, the familiar form of their target approaches the first bridge, and Jules stands up straighter on their small boat. All right, boys, here she comes. Just like last time, quick and slick. Bring us around, Jax. The half-elf turns the boat and positions it so that as the barge passed, they would nearly be side by side. Everything was going according to plan, until Jules notices how quiet the barge seems. Normally, there was some sound of the crew, the captain shouting orders as they ready to dock, but tonight, there was nothing. Goosebumps break out, all along her skin, as Jules whispers to her crew. Something, something ain't right. Not a moment after the words left her mouth, a beam of light shot out from the barge, blinding them momentarily. As she blinked through the glaring spotlight, Jules could make out a tall female figure standing on the bow of the barge. This is Deputy Angelique Loveless by the authority of the Alkenstar Shield Marshals. You are under arrest. For a moment, Jules couldn't feel her heartbeat. This was impossible. How were the Shield Marshals on the barge? Unless... Mugland. This was a setup. Jules begins to tremble, the wave of rage that washes over her nearly as blinding as the spotlight had been. She would pay that little son of a bitch back with interest, but first she had to get away from this. Scatter! She quickly pulls her gun, shooting out the light. She and all her crew jump straight into the foul, polluted water of the Estrati and swim for their lives. Bullets whiz overhead and sirens ring out all along the banks of the river, but against all odds, Jules manages to escape capture. But she knows this is it. She was ruined. She couldn't go back home, her crew would be scattered to the wind, and even if she could find them, they wouldn't trust her again anytime soon, if ever. She was a wanted woman, and navigating Alkenstar even more under the radar than usual was going to be hard, but no matter how hard, she would get her revenge. Crawling from the muddy banks of the river, the water on her skin starts to sizzle and steam rises from her rapidly heating body. Mullen thinks he can play me for a fool. We better think again. Turning down a darkened alleyway, her eyes and her hair begin to softly glow. Molten gold and magma red hues radiate from her as her fury grows. Hell on. You play with fire. You're gonna get burned. 